Hi, I'm Kumi Taguchi. I'm going back to school with Student Edge. What were you like as a teenager? Oh, I was very in my own head, you know. On the externally, I was kind of really engaged with my friends and loving school and really sort of enjoying the school life, going well at school, playing the violin, playing sport. But I was still really cerebral, so most of my time actually I was sort of just thinking about life and um, trying to figure out this sort of scope of the world. So I kind of had this dual personality, I would say. You know, people would say at school you were so relaxed and happy and engaged, but inside I was probably more um, really thoughtful, really unsure and really insecure. Well, I understand at the same time you were, and I read that you were growing up riding horses and eating Japanese food. This seems like a pretty unique Australian experience. How did that kind of mesh with all this kind of world exploring in your own head? That's such a good question because I had this experience of having a Japanese father, Australian mother, but my Australian mother infused my life with Japanese culture and food and language and we travelled to Japan and saw my grandparents and, and then I was sort of living this Aussie life but I sort of wasn't a typical Aussie kid. So at the same time as all these other questions are going on, I'm also starting to realise that mm, I'm not sort of the same as everyone else. And those raise, raises so many other questions. But everyone you talk to has those same questions, right? It, mine was to do with my ethnicity. Other people's might be to do with their sexuality or their identity in so many other ways. So um, that, was a, that was a huge aspect. And I do remember quite distinctly, you know, when you, you're about 16 and you have your first formal, you know, in around year 10, thinking I can't find anyone to take to my formal. And I remember feeling like all the girls who looked different to me, who were like blonde haired and blue eyed, they all seemed to have really great boyfriends to take the formal. And I was kind of sitting there on my own going, oh God, who do I take? And in, in the end, I think my sister, my older sister, lined up a friend of hers just to come with me to the formal, which was so nice of him. Um, and we had a great time. Um, but yeah, that, that was, there were the sort of things of like, yeah, I'm definitely different and how do I manage that space and how do I feel about that? And you mentioned music earlier yes. as well. Now, you had a scholarship to study violin? That's right, yeah. So what happened there? Because you're not a no, professional not a violinist. violinist today. I, um, <laughs> I'm not. I got into university on a violin scholarship and I'd played the violin since I was five, so the last few years of high school I was practicing about six hours a day as well as normal school and HSC and all that kind of thing. And enjoying it at the same time? Um, yeah, I did. It was more a discipline as well, to be honest. You know, I was just so used to practicing all the time and I quite like achieving things, so um, I'd go for the next exam and the next exam and try and get better and better. I remember sitting in a concert hall when I was about 19 watching the Sydney Symphony Orchestra and there was a amazing violinist playing at the front. And I was sitting there thinking, mm, if I turn this into my profession, where in that orchestra will I be sitting? Will I be at the front? Will I be in the middle? Will I be down the back? Like realistically, how good or not am I? And I remember thinking, if I was really lucky, I would be somewhere in the middle section, maybe. And some part of me felt like it wasn't where I wanted to be. So I gave that up and I ended up playing in some rock bands and, and doing some sort Still on of, the violin? Yeah, still on the violin <laughs> later on in life, sure. just to kind of re-pick up the instrument. But I then focused all my attention on media studies and um, filmmaking and kind of which is where I got to from there to here. But um, the violin was a huge part of my life and then throughout my 20s I went through a lot of um, questions around should I have given it up? is that where I should have focused my career. I spent so long in my childhood perfecting this instrument um, had I m immaturely given it up, but I, I don't think so. But you still, again, raise those questions again of why did I make that choice at the time. So where did the passion for journalism come to the fore? You said through filmmaking, but how did that kind of evolve? Still through that early childhood of, you know, asking those big questions, I suppose it was those um, big stories that kind of dragged me out of my teenage introspection. When I thought life was sort of tough, I'd then look at images of poverty somewhere else or I'd think about JFK's assassination and my brain would start working and I would, it would drag me out of my little world actually and I really enjoyed that. So I've always been someone who overthinks. Um, as I've got older I tend to overthink less which is good but 
journalism was just the perfect fit for me because I could ask those big questions and I could also shift my own emotional space out into something that was more tangible and real. And then when I walked into an actual newsroom, I just felt so excited. I still feel excited actually. I love the environment. I love a control room. I love the live nature of news. I love this dynamic that you have with the people you work with. So as soon as I worked into my, walked into my first job, um, I just thought, oh, this is it. I'm, this is exactly where I'm meant to be. When you made that change from music away and into the media, were your parents on board? Were they, were they disappointed that you weren't sticking with music or were they quite glad that you were, had found this kind of other, other thing? It's a really good question. I've never actually asked my mum directly. I think she was probably, she's always been quite supportive of what I do. There was a feeling though there that I would let my family down because they'd invested so much time and money into this instrument and it was sort of my identity really. It was always like, oh, Kumi, she plays the violin. So look, I think they, mum was probably, uh, probably there was probably a little bit of disappointment, but um, I never sensed that that was something that she felt disappointed about. It was probably more just, okay, well, that's her journey and she's got to take that. So I was quite lucky in that way. When you look back in your teenage years, do you have any regrets? I suppose I wish I worried less. I was a real perfectionist, so I wanted to do the best in all my studies and, um, was disappointed if I got 98, not 99, all those kinds of things. So part of me thinks I wish I'd worried less, but then when I look back at it, I think, well, that is who I am. So perhaps that um, studying and perhaps wanting to get 99, not 98, built me some kind of discipline that now I apply in my real life. So when I look back, I think, well, that is who I was, that is who I am, and I probably really couldn't change much. So the pressure to kind of be, um, you know, there's, I think there's this pressure in society to be relaxed and happy and easygoing and all loving and, and sun loving and sporty and surfing and, and playing tennis and looking great in a bikini and also reading Nietzsche, you know, it's not possible. Um, so I suppose if I gave any advice to my younger self, it would probably be um, not to be so hard on the person that you are.